Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for being here at this unhuman time to be delivering a presentation where we will be fighting to keep our brains awake while the blood is mostly going to the guts, but I'm sure we, we will do the best. Uh, today we will start uh, this afternoon with a presentation from uh, uh, Totti Connola. Uh, he has been already introduced, but in any case, he's the Managing Director of Sustainability and Innovation Consultants Luonto, Inside Foresight Institute, and also a Professor Foresight at the uh, University of Alcala. Uh, then I will be accompanied by other members, Peter Desmet, he's uh, academic in system analysis, and he is mostly working with experts and stakeholders towards achieving a common understanding of non-sustainable trend using scenarios and other foresight tools. Then we'll have Mark Rullian. Uh, he's the head of the Energy Foresight Planning and Regulation Unit at the Catalan Institute of Energy, IKN, of the uh, Government of Catalonia, in industrial engineer specialized in energy from the University Polytechnic of Catalonia. And finally, we have Jordi Turren. He's the strategy director of the Port of Barcelona, where he develops a strategic plan and adapts the port to the objectives of late tail global and regional trade and logistic trends. Uh, uh, you have the full bio in your folder, so I think it's better that we start with Toti with his keynote uh, presentation. Do you want to do it from here, or do you want to go to? Um, here's the advantage I see what I'm talking if I have the slides. <laughs> yeah, well. Uh, Thanks everybody for staying with us. Uh, it's been a long day, extremely uh, interesting discussions during the morning, and that creates a major challenge then, okay, do we still have uh, more things to add on that? Um, um, from my perspective, I try a bit bring uh, things from Finland and uh, experiences from the European uh, projects mainly. Um, I'm from Inside Foresight Institute, it's located in Madrid. And um, we've been involved in two of these uh, uh, initiatives that Susanne mentioned already, the uh, Foresight on Demand Consortium. Uh, foresight on Demand, really like the idea to quickly respond to needs that uh, especially the uh, Commission and it, the agencies uh, may need uh, related to Foresight, related to Insight. So there's the issue of timing that come to my head as an important element. And <coughs> I, I of Europe uh, continue building this uh, European-wide platform that you are welcome to, to join. <laughs> okay, so we've been talking a lot about uh, what is uh, really the connection between the foresight and the policy maker. Okay, maybe I say still a, a word or two. Um, from these days, conversation, at least for me, come to important aspect that the foresight uh, uh, somehow reflects the, the context where it's developed. So we, we saw already that there are different approaches to foresight and uh, uh, in the way as it, it reflects because it needs to adapt to the certain context where it is. So it's natural that we have different type of foresight activities and foresight is uh, integrated in different manners. And well, other aspect here is, uh, of course, the, um, the, all that is defining then is like what is foresight, no? And um, what I mentioned already, that what I'm thinking is the timing. Like, if we come closer to policy, of course, we have the policy cycle, and we have snap elections, and uh, all kind of different surprises, and we really want to be relevant, we be, to be very quick, very agile quickly responding to, to different challenges. <clears throat> then we had this issue of, okay, uh, quantitative or qualitative. Over the years we've been trying to work on how to combine these two things. And always, at least in my, my head, I find the major challenge of uh, different timescales. So we mean develop models and we have the databases and we uh, 
uh, develop those to the certain uh, context and certain needs. Uh, it takes time. You need to have continuity uh, for the quantitative side, and then also the um, when you d try to combine this with qualitative work, uh, you may be a bit faster. But then, okay, how you then integrate that with that quantitative work? So uh, when you top on that, the connection with the policy, so it becomes really like a, a, a major challenge. But I, I think it's worth trying, continued working on that. We already mentioned earlier today the, the relevance of certain sectors of the quantitative work, like energy, then maybe the other sectors where there's not exactly the similar type of uh, tradition. Um, but um, <coughs> anyway, these different uh, traditions and different um, approaches we have in different sectors can also be an opportunity we work hard. I, I, my feeling is that at least during the, uh, today is not to give up, but to work hard on how to make these connections uh, happen. Um, here's a bit what I thought uh, talking today. I think much of the things have some, partly already mentioned today. Um, I've seen uh, quite a bit of uh, more interest on foresight recent years. Um, probably um, partly because of all the crises and uh, uncertainties we're facing. But then there are also uh, other aspects like um, more this longer term uh, transformative or mission-oriented innovation policy and also other sectors kind of clear uh, need to understand the future visions, give flesh, flesh, flesh around the bones or the, uh, uh, enrich those uh, and policy goals to, to understand what it would really mean if we want to go 2050 or 2040, a certain, for example, a carbon neutral uh, uh, economy. <clears throat> and then the, the pathways also seem to be something that there is a need for how to really uh, create uh, certain transitions. So uh, foresight work seem to be more and more demanded on, on how to develop that. When it comes to in, uh, embedding uh, to institutions or institutionalization, uh, I come from Finland, so I think more of the ecosystem of how we have it foresight integrated in, in society rather than only in the single organization. And uh, Philin was talking about the complex systems. <laughs> I had it also here in my slide, like I said, complex adaptive systems, uh, like thinking of uh, <coughs> if the world is complex, maybe our response needs to be complex as well. Yeah, sounds like crazy, because why not simplify if everything's so complex? But it, from the complex adaptive systems comes the idea that we kind of to be able to uh, quickly respond to the changes or have this kind of new uh, emergent properties, basically capacity to reinvent ourselves. We, we need to have a certain uh, aspects. So I talk more about this, uh, this idea. Uh, connecting a bit on how, how things are done in Finland. Um, other aspects important on institutionalization and foresight, again, very much aligned with what Philin said, is this issue of how, <coughs> instead of having silos, how the government can work together. So, um, during the last year, I was involved in the uh, mutual learning exercise in European level on a uh, whole of government approach. And we thought there quite a bit how the foresight can contribute to that, how to work uh, along the different uh, uh, departments. And of course, it's, uh, we think of really embedding the policy work, our uh, 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 foresight uh, activities are being irrelevant. Uh, this embeddedness, it requires uh, capacities in both sides, the, those who implement them and those who uh, kind of uh, are on the client side, ordering, depending, uh, you, you get what you ask in the way. So um, there's no way of escaping the, the building these capacities. Uh, what uh, earlier Henning was mentioning, the, all, the, all the training and, and also on the EU level, there's a lot of training, I think it's just fundamental to have. Uh, further uh, attention to the building the capacities and, and from there the, the culture and, and so forth. The embeddedness, um, well, um, 
it comes a bit, this, okay, the idea that, okay, we have the mandate uh, from the top uh, to get things forward. But uh, in many ways, I see it's a um, uh, yeah, double-edged problem because if we, uh, the mandate comes um, too much engagement or too much uh, co-opting the whole exercise, so we may uh, end up uh, missing some intellectual autonomy you know, in the exercises. Um, there are ways of uh, engaging during the process of different players, so it's looking for the balance, I think. So, but that's the, the main idea, what, what I uh, thought today. So I'd like to go a bit more in detail on, on these aspects. <coughs> um, well, we talk quite a bit of the resilience and preparedness. Um, I think there's a, a huge market for foresights on that space where we don't know exactly what is the problem nor the solution. And uh, so that we could say, okay, look, like with full horizon scanning, we can kind of address that space. We can um, increase a different kind of uh, opportunities for exchange and learning from uh, uh, different uh, players and kind of be more connected and, and, and through that work uh, improve the preparedness. And, and then, of course, to work specifically on how our uh, administrative systems can be better prepared for those crises that we know already or, or, or possible new crises. Uh, here are some examples from foresight and demand work we, uh, we did for the uh, uh, commission. Um, so here, of course, we, we have um, uh, some triggers, and like in this case, the, the first two uh, is the COVID-19 that kind of um, Create, created major change, and uh, society will be kind of perplexed in society, okay, what happened? Uh, those changes that occurred, are those lasting or not? Uh, making sense of that kind of, uh, there has been a, a big change, and then after that, see, okay, how, uh, uh, how, how far uh, those impacts will um, uh, dictate a bit on kind of the, the future developments. And, then in the same space, we, we did also work at the, the one on the civic resilience. So uh, with foresight work, we can uh, look for areas that uh, may not have received um, necessarily uh, sufficient attention. So there's quite a bit of resilience work on the uh, government level, more from the top down. But how about the bottom up? So, uh, so that one way of uh, helping to uh, contribute on, on, on that conver uh, conversation. The other aspect is the, the visioning. We'll be talking a lot about the scenarios. Um, so uh, scenarios, well, um, can help not only just um, as such uh, provide up different uh, uh, different futures are expanded, but we can find ingredients from different scenarios to develop uh, and, and, and detail our vision. And then uh, the, the other aspect here is, of course, the um, exist, existing visions that we have already, so how foresight work can uh, enrich those and help us to make them more, um, let's say, better to understand what, they are, what are the implications and help them to develop policies to that. So um, we, we supported the European Commission um, mission areas uh, to detail their, their, their visions and, and help them to explore how the mission areas should be developed uh, uh, in coming years. <coughs> Um, we were also with the European um, Environmental Agency. I think that tells something about uh, the times we live. Um, the work they've been doing has been mainly on uh, defining, basically, getting the data and, and then um, project, making projections how the world evolves. And it looks like, if it comes to environment, pretty bad. So they, there's a tension year after year more to do, okay, maybe it's not enough only uh, provide the data, but also contribute, so what? What can we do after, uh, on that? So 
there is an interesting uh, work uh, on, going on in, in the agency on exploring how to contribute to also to those needed transitions that are, are pretty urgent. So uh, the foresight can help to enrich, of course, then to to provide difference. Yeah. Sorry. Can, can we leave the questions for later, if you don't mind? So save it, and, and, and okay. later we will give. Yeah, I, I take note. Um, and in, in all this uh, vision in the work, is I think it's exactly to, to look for always what is the um, the. Um, Potential of looking, uh, searching for the, 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 the consensus. So, so we, if you look at the missions, there is kind of this, um, the idea that there is a common interest to develop those areas. And uh, uh, depending how far that consensus goes, so you can squeeze more, <laughs> and uh, uh, we can provide further, more and more, uh, uh, basically flesh around the bones and make it more and more. Uh, let's say, it justified the efforts on that direction. So there is a certain line, I think, how far the foresight works actually is meaningful on the, in the work where uh, maybe we have already pretty clear what is the vision. Is it foresight still if we, our work is mainly about <coughs> justifying the existing uh, policy goals? Or is foresight rather how to <coughs> maybe challenge those and see, okay, maybe it's not all that uh, uh, straightforward. Maybe there's a need for uh, some alternative measures and kind of keeping us uh, more awake, uh, challenging, and, and offering uh, then maybe some <coughs> new thoughts how to, uh, how to ensure, how to truly future-proof rather than uh, justify the, the policy goals. <coughs> And the third point, I see there is an increase in demand for, uh, for foresight, um, and the strategic foresight is <coughs> these uh, uh, different needs of how to really make the pathways. If it's um, for roadmaps or, or basically defining the pol um, uh, action agendas. And um, in this area, um, we have, um, of course, the, the, the a green transition, a good, a good example, where we have these long-term um, targets that are way beyond any <laughs> policy cycle um, that policymakers can comfortably define. But then, to really make it happen, we need to build the path there. And uh, industrial decarbonization uh, roadmaps are done across Europe with, uh, depending on country, a bit uh, different. Uh, incent incentivity, um, but um, all in all, um, there are uh, great opportunities not only to build the path, but um, um, one path, but there were alternative paths, so it comes closer to, to scenario work. It's a space where we can <coughs> do quite a bit of this combining of different methods, quantitative and qualitative, so there's a, a major need to understand truly if something is possible or not. Uh, in Finland, uh, industry sectors were doing by sector together uh, with the ministry support and consultancies uh, using some common databases and uh, uh, looking kind of across the sectors and what is the how are the patents, uh, how about the really if we go and build new, new plans or uh, not only for patents or innovations but really when start scaling up things and we start making investments uh, how realistic it is to really achieve those targets. And, and it's, it's really on, 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 on hard work, um, but it is um, yeah, uh, important, of course, that, that there are key players uh, engaged who are then later on also making those investments so they become realistic and they should buy in. Okay, so that's a bit about uh, demand, as I see uh, right now. And then on these uh, ideas on the ecosystem and uh, um, 
the, the role of uh, institutions. Um, the idea basically introduced by feeling that these complex systems, I, um, I see the, that the society is uh, yeah, in, clearly easily to be defined like that, but also why not the, the foresight system that try to understand that complexity. So, um, building on that idea, um, we have uh, basically three different uh, dimensions. What we could have some others too. Sometimes we could link here also the directionality and uh, the, how uh, the, uh, the different systems they have uh, mechanisms that create the directionality. Um, but let's have a look at these three uh, points a bit more in detail. So, we think about uh, diversity. So we today heard quite a bit about engaging citizens. Well, it comes from the very fact that foresight uh, or technology foresight seems to be very expert-driven activity. Then had extended from the, the same like if you think of science for policy, more in general, is it science for policy or knowledge for policy? So we need to kind of engage the societal players more and more. And that, uh, Legitimacy aspect, uh, really getting uh, everybody involved, uh, seemed to be interesting for uh, policy makers because there's a connection, with, we connect with the citizens, we are listening to them, we are uh, um, building on, 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 on their ideas. <laughs> uh, there's this conference on the future of Europe a couple of years ago, so basically we have the Commission, Council, Parliament, uh, is establishing a really big uh, initiative in Europe. Um, Council did an analysis and it was saying that basically 95% of all the ideas coming up were basically covered already by the uh, mechanism. So um, there's a challenge how to make those uh, type of activities really uh, adding up on, on, on the strategy work. They can be really good for building legitimacy but um, how we, we build on that, um, uh, and that works so that it contributes, it feeds in truly on, on, on offering a more strategic options. Uh, it's a challenge. Um, a piece of alternative take here is an um, example from Finland. Um, Citra, which is independent uh, fund, it's kind of under the parliament, but it's um, pretty much this as an independent uh, think tank. <clears throat> Some uh, years ago, 2014-15, they uh, launched a, um, a foresight exercise, a uh, road mapping exercise, uh, involving the diverse set of stakeholders, including, I think, four ministers, then the um, uh, economic players, uh, research, uh, NGOs, the number of participants was not really huge, but the diversity was there to, to kind of get the uh, engagement of different actors uh, in Finnish uh, society economy to, to explore the, uh, the circular economy and the, and the future steps on that. So this was not initiated by the government. It was coming outside from the government. But there were the uh, government uh, officials uh, taking part, and so the seat was uh, there. Uh, and um, then there were updates to that roadmap and engaged in wider set of participants. And gradually that exercise then got more uh, force and they developed a strategic uh, plat uh, program in the ministry. Um, the Ministry of Environment and, uh, and Economy. <clears throat> uh, in the end, well, uh, then there have been evaluations of the program and um, there are some shortcomings, even no matter how diverse the start was and how you get in, in, engage the different players and you, you create a momentum. But when the issue is that complicated, that we want to move from linear to circular, uh, it's not only that you have innovations and uh, you put them forward and, and you support different activities here and there, but you face soon the, the market structures. So basically to make really, uh, think same and, and scale up, you need to uh, touch on the, the existing structures, you need to look at the incentive structures, uh, the, the economies of scale of existing players, and so it becomes uh, 
way bigger exercise. But here, the, the point, what I want to say was really there, the, it launched really nicely because it built that kind of, uh, built on that diversity and legitimacy in, uh, among different actors that then saw themselves uh, heard. And interesting point was that it came outside from the government. Um, how much time? Again? Okay. About 10 minutes. Okay, great. About seven. Okay. So the other point of the complex system so, uh, was um, what I want to say is the polycentricity. So I, I mean by this that we have different nodes. So we don't just need to have one foresight a player somewhere or unit that then does the trick. Um, in Finland, uh, we have from the 90s in the parliament committee for the future, and they have every a policy cycle, they have a report from the government, and, and the government is under prime minister's office, there is a foresight uh, a unit that coordinates among the government, basically among the different ministries, and these ministries then work together to develop a report uh, uh, for, uh, for the uh, parliament, and uh, that kind of a uh, report that is connected to the policy uh, cycle, it helps um, <coughs> in the way building, um, first of all, understanding in the, uh, also uh, among the politicians. So there's a continuity. It's not uh, on the one party, but it's in the a committee where you have different uh, members from different parties uh, uh, um, interested in this topic. So it creates the culture and continuity also in the parliament. And in the same way in the, in, in the, in the government you have these kind of certain structures. Not only every four years you have a, a report, but there's actually the government, the, the ministries, they work every year, uh, a review. And, um, and that kind of uh, coordinated uh, work across the ministries then help to address difficult uh, problems, like wicked uh, problems like climate change and other issues. And climate change indeed was one of the issues that came up, uh, the, the Finnish response to climate crisis from that interministerial work on understanding that, hey, actually, there might be a chance to have quite ambitious targets. In Finland, it's 2035, we want to be carbon neutral. And to be able to uh, go public on that, you need to have <laughs> that foresight work, that forecasting work, that uh, quantitative and qualitative work and, and buy-in of among the different ministries um, uh, done. In, um, in Finland, it's not limited there, the foresight work. By far, there is so much uh, different agencies, like mentioned the CITRA and the uh, research uh, entities. There's a really strong academic uh, base in, in, in Finland, uh, in, especially in Turku, but also in other uh, units. And this kind of a polycentricity of different uh, units that creates a, a kind of a challenging views also. To avoid with this polycentricity, we don't necessarily are married with the one goal. So basically, if we would see the, this uh, government foresight reports looking boring or really limited, uh, or something we could have these challenges coming from <laughs> out of that uh, governmental system to, to offer also alternatives. Um, so, that creates kind of some continuity. And uh, the third point here um, that's connected strongly with the polycentricity and what I was saying earlier is that the connectivity. So um, we really want to institutionalize this in our, our activities of foresight. Um, it's not that we have only uh, diverse players, diverse actors uh, working on foresight, and we have these nodes, but these nodes and actors, they need to be connected. Uh, in Finland, uh, CITRA and the uh, Prime Minister's Office, they are together uh, coordinating the National Foresight Network. It's a pretty open uh, uh, network for uh, different uh, uh, actors to join and, and change, uh, their, uh, exchange their views on uh, and the results of the, uh, the foresight um, activities. And uh, then, of course, but we already earlier heard on, on, on different systems, like uh, ESPAS, for example, um, is building a, um, developing the foresight and knowledge base. Um, mentioned uh, um, the Initiative of Futures for Europe uh, platform. Here you have the link, so please have a look. <laughs> you can register and, and be part of the community. 
So um, we need to connect uh, uh, different actors, and uh, it doesn't need to be on, on, on any specific level. So we can have here multiple uh, level in engagements and, uh, and see how in different contexts uh, uh, we come up with different solutions and, and learn from others. That diversity can also be their valuable asset. A um, few words about still on uh, embeddedment, uh, embeddedness. Um, the capacities, I think, it become quite uh, clear from the earlier uh, work. But um, this uh, lower level here, the intellectual autonomy and, and, and mandate and engagement is uh, a difficult uh, balance. Uh, Philin had, the, I think if I got it right, the idea is that, yeah, the kind of the foresight work should be connected, but keep it somehow separate. Uh, my feeling is that this is strongly connected to the, the foresight culture, the, the, the role of foresight in, uh, in, in society or in, 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 in different, in, in the country and in the, in the context where, it, where it's made. So uh, how far foresight is perceived uh, really as a, as a threat or as an opportunity depends a lot on uh, how close to policymaker we can we can be. Uh, in any case, uh, I see uh, the engagement of policymakers, uh, individual level, and in, in, in the process uh, extremely valuable for both for the for the exercise and for the participants. Uh, so that a transfer from foresight exercise to uh, policy making, it may happen through some results, the reports, and then are taking up, and there's a recommendation, and then you go and implement, or we have participants learning through the foresight exercise, and then they take up those uh, lessons learned uh, when they start implementing the policy. So both can be very, uh, um, let's say, uh, reasonable pathways. And, and all that, it's uh, yeah, indeed important that foresight remains also the challenger. So that's why the intellectual autonomy. So it's not co-opted by, by the system too far. And final slides. Um, well, you should finish. Ah, okay, so just fi final three pointers, striking the balance. Um, I see it often, uh, the relevance of uh, insights we provide for policy making or, or decision making more in general. Uh, more probable we are, more we are listened, but, uh, and more it's perceived relevant, but maybe those alternative visions are more relevant to bring on the table because others may not be saying that. So that balance is difficult. And then the other point uh, is the safe space. We think this is something, this, okay, the closed door discussions, no matter how much we have extensive participation, let's keep also uh, the, the space for uh, changing ideas without uh, reporters uh, and making sure that they can be trusted uh, conversations among uh, decision makers. And thanks a lot for your attention. Okay, I now invite the, the other members of the panel if they want to comment on uh, the presentation. Who wants to break the ice? Otherwise, I'll break the ice. Uh, no, just before I, I say, I comment on, I react on the presentation, let me say one thing is a little bit uncomfortable in an all men panel nowadays. Uh, I know we discuss the panel, so just apologies for the ladies in the room uh, to be part of this panel. Okay. Um, no, second, I just want, I mean, I'm the head of strategy at the Porto Barcelona, so um, no, I feel reflected on some of the things you, you said. I'm just going to mention one to leave other people, other room for the others to, to react as well. No, I am, when we, for instance, did our latest strategic plan that covers the period 2020-2025, we did it, uh, we had one option, which was to do it alone with a foreign consultant, with a consultant and help us, and we decided to do it together with 200 different people, no? um, diverse, um, uh, how did you, what do you say, to, to, pro to give some legitimacy to the plan, okay? which had to be approved by our board of directors. But more than 200 people involved, more than 100 institutions involved, both from the private sector, from the public sector, local, international. So I think uh, strategic planning is something very specific, no? but uh, having this diversity um, and so many uh, actors involved gives a lot of legitimacy when you do something like, in this case, a strategic plan of a board for a certain period that has to be approved by its board of directors. So that's
Thank you. Uh, Peter, who want to move next? Thank you. Peter Smet, uh, Flemish government. Um, what I liked in your presentation was also you have been giving a lot of examples pointing out on the diversity. And I think that's, that's really the value of, of foresight. It's, uh, it's a lens that can bring support to policy making, makers, but it's important to be um, quite open and to, to listen what is really needed, what is happening, and how foresight can bring insights that are really supporting policy making. So what I appreciated was the diversity. You had visions, you had pathways, you had different tools. And I think that's a key element of foresight, bringing diversities in ideas, diversities in approaches to policy making. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Mark? Yeah, I think uh, that if we can try to foresight future, uh, but if we want, we, we can try to do it, but if we want to be useful for society, uh, or, or to translate uh, this vision into something useful, I think we uh, we need a political will uh, and or political will or or, or the, the the will of the society to, to know what society wants. No, so in in that case uh, or in, in my field, no, it's uh, the energy field or, or the climate change. No, here we have a long term uh, objectives that are of concern of every everybody wants uh, uh, to have more renewables. Everyone, everybody wants to, to, to have more energy efficiency, you know? So this clear policy goals helps us to, to have also a, a, a clear end to, to our pathway, you no? Know? And I think that this, uh, adding to this, um, that the government could, uh, can work together also with society um, is the key of the, of the, the successful uh, to be successful, no? For instance, here in, in Catalonia now we have um, uh, roadmaps uh, or visions for the different uh, economical sectors, no? The, the industry, the um, uh, uh, the services, uh, and, and these roadmaps are roadmaps to de decarbonize our society. So these roadmaps must be implemented and during this implementation must be uh, accepted for all the society and uh, all the, the, stakeholder, the stakeholders who will have to, to, to adopt uh, the objectives. You know? So the, I think the, this is the, the, the key or, or one of the, the most important things uh, to, be, to have a, a vision or a foresight that are uh, useful for our societies. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Uh, well, abusing of my position of chair, I, I also would like to make some comments. Because looking at the audience, I think I'm probably the one that has been doing foresight of future studies. It was the name back in the day for the longest. I, I think complexity is really in the key thing. Uh, back in the day, when I was starting, complexity was like a, an option, something that could choose to add or not to projects. Today, it's at the very center of almost every single issue we deal with. So, back in the day, we would try to simplify how we can purge some uh, variables, how we can chop off some aspects and just focusing on the crucial central variables. Today, it doesn't work. Uh, so, this notion that instead of simplifying, we might attain a more profound simplicity, but that's still an unresolved question. If we believe that complexity is, is, is at the bottom of every issue, then diversity also cannot be a choice. It's not something that gives us a plus that makes us gain legitimacy. It's something we have to deal with. There's no way to get around it because our societies are complex and diverse. So we must be able to face uh, this diversity on equal terms. And then there is Maybe I'm, I'm, I'm misreading your presentation, but when you were talking about complex and sometimes complicated issues, and, and you mentioned the four horizons, because you see that also makes me think in, in, in all school foresight that we tend to plan uh, more complex, more difficult issues at longer terms. So when something, the more difficult, the more complex, we place it in the third, fourth horizon. 
Well, that doesn't happen anymore. I mean, we should have learned something from COVID is deep changes can happen very fast. So just hoping that deeper, more complex things will happen later is also uh, uh, misleading. Uh, but uh, maybe now you want to reply <laughs> to us. <laughs> well, um Uh, um, road mapping uh, work and uh, so th there is this buy-in of the actors and it, it's connected to the legitimacy uh, but um, there is um, it's really closely connected to uh, also to understand really how are the things? So that we need that diversity. It's what you say. It's not an option, the diversity. So there is this aspect of legitimacy. So we need to, to be. We need to get the buy-in, but to buy into what we need them to uh, contribute uh, to get the, the, the full picture. So um, of course, the, the diversity. I think also what, what uh, Peter was referring to that. Uh, it's diversity of, of, of different things, not only participants, but a different perspective, how we address the, the foresight, or, or different type of um, yeah, ch challenges. And, and keeping this in mind, keeping this in the portfolio, I, I think that's uh, important. So not to go with the kind of a sil silver bullet idea that, okay, we just set the vision and then we, we go there with all the means we have, but rather to come um, to the humility, so basically this, the whole, uh, humility of, is Europe still the center of the, the, the global uh, development? So with those earlier the conversation that we need to kind of in the way see what China, US are, are doing and we need to um, in, in many ways um, accept that uh, in richness and, and not to be, not, accept that we are not always in the driving seat. No? And, and that uh, methodologically it's uh, way more ch challenging to kind of question all that, okay, so what if it's all actually complex and they can this, the figure what Philin had, the, the complex system, the ball can go from one end to another very quickly and it, it can uh, change the, the state of the game. So um, I, I think for foresight work, it's just a, a, a massive challenge to accept that we need to be faster, we need to be more agile, we need to be more adaptive. And, and if we manage to do that, then we're also relevant for policy. <laughs> Because much of the, the problem from foresight work is that we have a different uh, uh, tempo <laughs> than, than policy. And, the, and sometimes it's impossible to know what is the tempo of the policy because of the snap elections and different changes. So, um, but it, I was trying with those, uh, that policy centricity thing, kind of also, maybe I didn't emphasize the, the importance of policy centricity. It may help to create continuity for foresight work. So if we have one unit, no matter how good it is, but if there is a change in elections, there is a wind coming from here or there, what happens? Is there continuity for foresight work? And especially when, there, when it comes to more like the quantitative work where you need to build and develop the, your, your uh, databases, your, your models, your, your approaches. Um, maybe with AI, we become faster with all that too, so we can get faster results, but do we understand them, so the, the, the results? So uh, I think there's difficulty to avoid that. We need to build mechanisms that create continuity for this kind of activity. And one way to do that is to have several poles where you do foresight work. So if one falls, then the other one can raise. No? That's right. Okay, so let's carry on. Now we will have uh, shorter presentations by the other members. So Peter, if you want to... Go ahead. Yeah, thank you. Um, uh, the clicker. Uh, you need to change the presentation. Yes. Now it's that outward moment that we all get to see the guides of the different presentations. <laughs> okay, so yeah. Yours. Perfect. Thank you. I want to share with you some some insights that um, that we have on embedding foresight uh, in government but also highlighting the multi-level uh, perspective. Coming from Flanders, um, 
you will understand why we strongly believe that a multi-level perspective is, is needed and is important. Um, which one? Ah, yes. Okay. So I work at the Chancellor and Foreign Office. We support the Prime Minister, the Mr. President of Flanders. We have many. Uh, um, we are responsible for many topics, including international and European trade policies, but also development cooperation, communication and reputation policy, um, strategic goods and control. And in our department, we also have a pillar on evidence-informed policy making. So it's true that on the future we don't have any facts, but by being structured, by using scientific methodologies, we can create some insights, and in a way, insights that has a label of being evidence-informed. And that's what we do. Um, Flanders has delegations not only uh, in Europe, but also outside the world. And therefore, we believe that foresight is really an interesting approach to connect, to connect insights, to connect people, ideas, um, to understand the global challenges, understand what of the global challenges um, we have in common. Last year, we did a really nice uh, process project with, uh, with 10 other regions, including uh, the Catalan region. And, um, and I, I would also uh, uh, pay special thanks um, because we worked with three regions more closely to see, to better understand how we can do that. So last year in June, we were here and it was really, that was the first, it was kind of the first experimental workshop that we did. So it was really nice and we, we really appreciate it. And, and then in the end, um, did we really achieve some impact? Yes, uh, as part of the Belgian presidency, on the 18th of April, um, our minister president, Jan Bon, he invited all the political uh, representatives of these regions to Brussels. And it was a, an interesting discussion on these global challenges, but also opportunities for interregional collaboration. And also pointing out for, uh, for the EU institutions that if the vision is to have a resilient Europe, um, regions are part of that vision. To prepare that, um, we initiated uh, already in 2021 an initiative, and that initiative was called Strategic Foresight for Resilience. Um, so we listened and, and we understood that in the beginning of COVID, we used a lot of data, a lot of statistics, trying to make sense to trying to understand what was happening. And of course, if we're looking at uh, trade statistics, we could immediately see the impact. All the, all the borders were closed and that was reflected quite strongly um, everywhere, not only in Europe, but everywhere in the world. Um, but then trying to build or to work on the recovery. Um, we felt that recovery isn't good enough and that was also in line or also the Commission was embracing strategic foresight to bring resilience uh, besides the recovery. And um, as being responsible for uh, bringing evidence informed policy making, we felt that we need something more than only statistics. And therefore we created this initiative to build up anticipatory intelligence, the kind of information um, that is helpful to communicate also to, to society, what a government is doing in times of crisis, and also that some of the measures uh, that might seem a little bit um, out of place are important, perhaps not on the short term, but really um, are important to create, to see the opportunity to create a more resilient uh, Flanders, more resilient Europe. So it was contributing to the evidence-informed and future-proof decision-making, um, especially then uh, in a volatile, uncertain, complex and ambiguous world. So how did we do that? Um, we try to build uh, this anticipatory intelligence by using different foresight tools. So as Toti was also say, uh, mentioning, the diversity is not only in um, the different stakeholders, uh, also including citizens,
but it's also the diversity is also related with different foresight tools. So it's all about horizon scanning, it's about creating uh, scenarios, uh, but it's also about um, trying to think on, on, on having an impact and um, creating different kind of, of uh, indicators. So something that, uh, that we have been experimenting is also the uh, resilience indicators. And it gives a, a different perspective to policy making. The resilient indicators are not de um, developed to have a, uh, an image of the, the past or uh, sometimes the present, but they are designed to give uh, strategic insights on what is happening, um, what are the, the, the possibilities, uh, what are the capacities of a region or a country or, or Europe uh, as a whole to anticipate uh, changes, to anticipate crises uh, on one side, but also to be quite honest in times of crisis, um, what are the weak spots? And it also means that even in a time of crisis, as a government, you need to invest um, in these weak spots. And perhaps it will not help on the short term, but definitely by building and working on the weak spots uh, for the next crisis, we will be more prepared. So that's all about uh, being more uh, anticipatory. Uh, we haven't been doing that on our own. Um, as mentioned, doing foresight is getting out of your silo. So you can see some examples. Uh, we had a pleasure to work with different organizations, including also some of the federal organizations uh, in Belgium, uh, and also including CITRA and, uh, and, and other initiatives. The thing that I want to share with you today is when you want to engage with politicians and policy makers, you really need to be very clear what can you deliver. And therefore, we created these four functions. And because you can imagine within government, there are many services and they all have their material, they have their practices um, to support uh, the politicians. And um, to have a mandate and to have the ability to do foresight, you need to be very precise, what can you deliver? And the first thing, and it's really an important one, is the discovery. Who else in government has the mandate and the time to scan trends, to understand and to, make, to differentiate between different signals? Are we, as a government, are we aware of what is happening around us? Do we uh, make time to, to understand the trends? So for us, being clear about the first function is really important. And um, most often uh, in the past, there was a desire to go directly to a, a kind of um, vision. And having the four functions helps us to better uh, explain what we can deliver and uh, why do that we need some time to do that. So after the discovery, it's also important then to uh, engage in exploration to include different perspectives, to be uh, more inclusive. And then it comes with tools like horizon scanning, but also pattern and system analysis and dealing with complex systems, but also engaging with science. Uh, and we have an example that we, that we uh, did in 2022, and I will share with you on that. So after the discover and the explore, then it's important to make the link with policy to map the opportunities and challenges. And also there, there are some tools, including explorative scenarios. And then finally, to ensure that we have an impact, we need to create something. We need to construct um, a reference point into the future. And that can be a vision, it can be a roadmap, um, but it can also be connecting people and, and um, engaging stakeholders in your vision, in your roadmap. Because for sure, we know that as a government, um, especially in times of crisis, society is looking to the government to solve everything. But as a government, you can, you can engage and you can start uh, doing things. But you need your stakeholders. You cannot do that on your own. So therefore, also, um, creating coalitions for the future um, is an important impact. As promised, I give you an example. So this... Uh, 
uh, was something that we organized in 2022. Um, science to policy dialogue, so we in invited uh, scientists, but also policymakers to spend the whole day together um, to engage in these strategic conversations. And that's also something that Foresight has a strong, um, a strong ability to, to do. And, and, and most often, if you read how business is doing Foresight, they are um, uh, pointing out that the strength in your foresight is all about the strategic conversations. So bringing people together, getting a better understanding on the challenges, think and learn about possibilities, and then create visions on how you can work together with the stakeholders to uh, engage in the, in the change. So the output was uh, a knowledge exchange, and you would say that's, that's easy. Uh, yes, but do we take the time to do that? Um, and most often, um, the interactions with, with science is happening, but spending a whole day together, that's really what you need. And most often, especially in times of crisis, we don't take the time to do that for a whole day. So that's something that we learned. Three minutes, okay. <laughs> I will speed up. So this was a really interesting uh, approach. I also want to highlight that, as a government, it's not easy to disseminate the kind of insights so most often we choose different challenges, yeah, because if you publish it as an official report from the government, especially in the media, you can get some uh, strange reactions. Yeah, if it's about scenarios, um, they will take one and they, they, they would uh, criticize it. Um, and that's not the value of scenarios is in the multiplicity and not picking one out and giving criticism. So we published in a, in a dedicated journal. Um, the second example I want to give is uh, the scenario project that we did with, uh, with the 10 uh, regions uh, in Europe. So we started with the trend analysis. Based on that, we constructed four scenarios. We added evidence uh, from uh, a platform uh, based on horizon scanning. That was Futures Platform. It's a spin-off of the Turku University. And then in the end, we created scenarios. And these scenarios have been, and Paul can testify, uh, can, can, um, uh, can give more information also on that. In one day, we were able to present and emerge the, the colleagues in the four different worlds. And that is really important. The diversity of the scenarios is a key feature. And then in the end, um, the, the, the leaders' meeting came up with a declaration uh, and an engagement. Um, next week, I will skip uh, this information. Next week, there will be an UCD blueprint, uh, a lunch seminar presenting the blueprint. So if you're interested, please let us know. We sent you the link, and then you can participate in there. The blueprint is giving guidance if you're in government and you want to uh, work with foresight. Uh, that's also for next week. Thank you. <laughs> Mark, uh, you will be next. Well, do you want the clicker? Um, no, I think uh, you use a computer. Compressor. Okay, so uh, I'm going to present our insights of the Catalan Energy Institute, which is part of the government of Catalonia, Generalitat de Catalunya. Uh, and I will try to explain to you uh, how we conduct foresight and apply to scenarios and energy, the energy considerations we took. And specifically, I'm going to talk about the energy pros perspective of Catalonia 2050, which is called PROINCAT. Uh, okay. First of, first of all, uh, let me briefly outline the contents of this presentation. Uh, initially, I will talk about, I will explain who we are and what we do at at ICAEN, at, at the Catalan Energy Institute. From there, I will present uh, the energy perspective in Catalonia, uh, and I will, well, I, I will. Uh, 
yes, at the end I will talk about the, the, the baseline work and, and the methodology we use, uh, apply it to this uh, energy perspective uh, 2050. Okay, uh, very fast. Catalan Energy Institute, ICAIN, is a body of the government of Catalonia, belonging the, to the Department of Climate Action, and it was established in 1991. Uh, currently, promotes the energy transition in Catalonia to achieve the, the, the decarbonization of, of our country. Uh, here you can see the main objectives and functions of the Catalan Energy Institute and, and, and I have selected especially the, the ones that are related to, to prospective, to foresight. Uh, and I want to, 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 uh, to talk about one of them, which is the, 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 that we are responsible for the energy statistics of Catalonia. This uh, provides us uh, with uh, valuable historical data designed specifically to inform uh, energy planning. So uh, it's very important for our department to have this data uh, because then allows us to, to, to make the, 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 the stage of the art, but, uh, but how uh, the energy sector is here in Catalonia. No? Uh, moreover, uh, the energy planning division is aware of the various sectoral policies that impact the energy field and thus uh, enable us to adopt a holistic approach uh, that we strive to apply to the development of foresight and, and planning uh, or energy planning. Uh, here is, uh, well, our department is, is, is organized in this way. Uh, you can see that, uh, first of all, uh, we have the short term, the programming, or we call them the, the programming, which is specific or strategic uh, plans uh, that are applied in the following three, five years, uh, such as uh, the strategy of biogas, this is one example. Then there's uh, the planning, uh, which is uh, 10 years uh, from now. Uh, and in that case, uh, we have the example of the, the, the plans uh, of the energy and climate plans. And finally, uh, perspective no? the, that is related to this foresight to, uh, in this case, is 2050, so it's more than 15 years. And, uh, well, the more recent uh, exercise of prospe perspective is Energy Perspective of Catalonia 2050, which was approved uh, a year ago, uh, a new year ago, uh, for the government of Catalonia. But uh, this is not something that we have started to uh, to, to, to work uh, for, for, for the last plan. Uh, this started in, nine, well, in the early 90s, in 1989, with SPREC, which was uh, one of the first programs uh, carried out in, in terms of energy here in, in Catalonia. Uh, then the, the ProInCAT 2030 uh, was another exercise, but it, this one it was not approved by the government. And here, Prenkat 2050 uh, was approved by the government. This document presents a, a vision of Catalonia's future energy system with the goal of establishing strategies to achieve a renewable or 100% renewable energy based system by the year 2050. Uh, to achieve this, the document sets out the, the guiding principles of the target scenario. Uh, we had a target scenario and I will explain, I'm going to explain how we selected that target scenario and the energy strategies. But in this, in, in this document, uh, or this foresight exercise was based, was, was based on certain premises uh, and a very clear objective, outlining it in the law on climate change and in the National Agreement on Energy Transition. And the objective or this goal was to achieve a 100% renewable energy system by 2050. So we had a premise or we had some, uh, this goal uh, and we, and, and ProEncat 2050 had to, to, to draw the pathway to achieve that goal. And the baseline works, uh, well, 
first of all, uh, as you may, th uh, may, may think, it's, it was not an easy task. Uh, Rokairet, uh, we started uh, Prenka 2050 in, in 2017. And it was approved after six years of developing different, uh, different works. Uh, and these works here, you have uh, four, um, well, a classification of the four baseline works. And then I will explain a little bit more. And if you want to talk about some of them, we can, we can speak then. Uh, OK. First of all, the strategy, the first one is a structural analysis, uh, which consisted on establishing and analyzing the various variables uh, that impact the energy sector in Catalonia. And the aim was to identify relationships among these variables to establish uh, an initial classification and prioritization uh, of the most important issues that affected uh, the energy system of Catalonia. The second one, it was uh, an analysis because uh, ProInCAD also had to, to, to give the responses to, to this question, an analysis uh, of the, the renewable energy source potentials. Uh, the third one, and very important in our sector, was the technological foresight. And finally, uh, there was a very in-depth analysis uh, of the uh, well, uh, model, uh, modeling of the energy demand. The first of them, uh, the strategic uh, analysis, uh, okay, was, uh, was based on four steps. The first one was the, the structural analysis, as I said, which was a holistic approach with a prioritization of uh, variables. Uh, this structural analysis was, we added a, a stakeholder mapping, uh, which was uh, um, the stakeholders that uh, were involved in the energy transition uh, here in Catalonia. Uh, and this work was informed by prior uh, experience in energy planning and relationships uh, with uh, key sector entities. Thirdly, uh, the scenario definition we, we uh, analyzed uh, different uh, alternatives, but, but uh, in that case, uh, and this is the, the fourth target, or the fourth uh, uh, the, the target scenario, that was the choice of this target scenario, including the strategies for achieving it, and, it, um, and we contrasted with a reference scenario consisting primarily of a trend-based scenario, but incorporating some major changes anticipated by 2015. Uh, these scenarios are very, very, well, here you have the, the guiding principles of the target scenarios. Uh, I will, I won't, uh, I'm not going to speak about them, but because you have very, very uh, defined it in the, in the document of uh, Prenca 2015. Okay, uh, the second task uh, or the second baseline work was the analysis of renewable energy source potential. Uh, as I said, ProEncat 2050 had one of its main goals to demonstrate the feasibility of, the, 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 of this scenario, no? uh, which uh, was based on Catalonia's energy and climate goals by 2050, the decarbonization of the, the entire uh, economic, uh, of the entire uh, Catalonia economic system. No? In this regard, one of the major challenges anticipated in the energy transition is the implementation of a 100% renewable energy system. And to achieve this, an electric electrification of energy demand and a shift in electric generation technologies toward renewables, uh, especially uh, photovoltaics and, and wind energy. So we had to demonstrate that it was possible uh, to, to make this, uh, this energy transition in Catalonia and it was possible and uh, the, the, the land use was not impossible to achieve it. This was demonstrated with the, with the ProEncat uh, 2015. Then, similarly, and, and in collaboration with, uh, with IREG, which is the, the Energy Research Institute of Catalonia, we developed a, a, a prospective uh, or technology prospective documents uh, of the key technologies 
to anticipate the the the, the main oh, yes the main changes that there will be in the in the future energy system of in Catalonia. And finally, the number four, the the, the energy demand modeling, which is something uh, very 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 spe specific. Uh, was part of this baseline works and, and this energy mo modeling was conducted to quantify all the qualitative work uh, that we had been carrying out in, in the other phases. Uh, broadly speaking, uh, this modeling was separated into the five energy consuming sectors, each of one uh, with its unique characteristics and, and its specific energy technologies. Uh, but if you want to talk about them, then we can well, explain some, some more details about this, this uh, modeling. And finally, uh, to conclude this explanation, uh, I, will, I would like to present some of the main results of ProEncat 2050. Uh, typically, we focus our presentations uh, more on this part, no, on the results. Uh, but today, I, I think that it was important to explain the, the the methodology or to give some ideas about the methodology because uh, I think it's more um, more appropriate to, to this seminar. And finally some ideas, some conclusions. Uh, well, first of all, having a, an energy foresight is a valuable tool at all levels of public ad administration. Uh, and I think that, and, and ultimately for society as a whole, uh, because it helps to define the, the necessary strategies to achieve the, the, the set objectives. Um, the second one is that, that the foresight exercise must involve the entire society, as I said before, uh, as it's the way to engage all affected stakeholders and make them reflect on the energy transition from their own specific uh, perspective and to be more involved then to, to achieve the, the, the specific goals. The one is that the energy perspective could not have been carried out in the same manner without the extensive knowledge and methodologies developed over many years. It's not uh, about uh, two years. Uh, we need a very uh, extensive knowledge to, to, to develop uh, an, uh, a perspective or a foresight of this kind. And finally, uh, I think that one of the things that, um, well, important for, for us is that we had a, a clear national objective um, facilitated uh, and, this, and thus facilitated the, the, the establishment of a reference scenario and definitely the, the development of the Catalonia's energy perspective and it's not always the, the not always happened that you you has a, so, so, um, a clear objective uh, but yes, uh, we had in this case, and this helps us to to develop this this perspective. And that's all. Thank you. So, Charlie, you wanna? You, 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 do you have a presentation? No. Okay. 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 Thank you. Thank you first for inviting the Porto Barcelona to this panel. I guess uh, a couple of reasons why we are here and why Victor and Paul invited the port here is that because, uh, one, because foresight work and in particular uh, demand uh, forecast in a port is extremely important. Why? Because um, normally when we take a decision, for instance, to, to develop a new container terminal, for instance, from the moment we take the decision till the moment this terminal is put into operation, it might last 10 years, even more, okay? So um, demand planning, foresight is extremely important uh, not to take wrong decisions, and often ports take wrong decisions. Uh, this is one reason. The second reason, I guess, is, and I, we were discussing this with Victor before, during lunch, uh, ports, uh, uh, international ports, Antwerp, for instance, uh, Barcelona, Valencia, uh, I always say, for me, it's a privilege to work at the port because these are probably the best observatories uh, we have in our countries, of international economic relations, of trends in macroeconomics. Um, so, uh, and, and, and it's a place where things happen a little bit earlier than other places. So we can anticipate, uh, sorry. So we can anticipate uh, 
a little bit sometimes certain things. And I'm going to put you three examples in months, not in years. Sometimes in years as well, okay? Um, I'm going to put you three, three examples. I started working at the port at the end of 2006. Um, after 30 years of double-digit growth of maritime transport in Europe, no? both in maritime transport, containers, etc. No? This is what all my colleagues used to know no? for the previous 20 years. Then suddenly, seven, 2007, a, thing, a few things started changing in the traffic flows. We saw how semen and consumer goods suddenly plummeted traffic. No? But the economy, everything, I was saying everything was going fine. No? At the point, we start seeing, I, I was new, and I said, okay, what is happening? No, you say we have certain traffic that were going down uh, uh, dramatically. No? Then one year after, all the crisis came, etc. No? This is one example. Second example. Um, I remember in, when the uh, invasion of Ukraine by Russia started in February 2022, I think, not 22. Um, I remember in uh, that uh, spring, and summer, everybody was saying, when we come back after holidays, this is going to be a disaster. There's going to be an economic crisis, some people say, like in 2008. No? Uh, I remember my president at that time, Damien Calvet, uh, were uh, discussing, how do you see the statistics at the port? I said, no, I'm, I'm not seeing anything very strange happening here. No, 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 no. Uh, we don't see what, what we were seeing in 2007, 2008. No? And uh, no, effectively, when we came back after summer, um, at least in Catalonia and Spain, uh, nothing happened. No? Okay? The economy didn't go down. A third example, very small. Um, every year in the port you can more or less plan how the touristic season is going to be. Uh, why? Because from Barcelona, from Valencia, the companies that rent cars send their cars from the ports to the Balearic Island, for instance. No? And depending on how many tens of thousands of cars they send to Mallorca, Ibiza, etc., more or less, you can have an idea on how the touristic season is going to be in the Balearic and elsewhere in the, in the country. Okay? The, so we can more or less anticipate sometimes a few changes, trends, in a few months in advance or even sometimes one, one year in advance. The problem is, as I said at the beginning, that we have to plan things that become a reality because we are not Chinese, unfortunately, let's say, but because they do it in one, two years, what we do in 10, 15 years. Okay? Um, and that's the problem we have. As, a, as ports. If we think of shipping, shipping lines, which are the main customers of ports, they have, foresight is extremely important as well. Uh, they have uh, shorter periods of production, let's say. Okay? When, when a big shipping line orders the book to a shipyard in Korea or in China, no, they do it. When they do it, the book is, um, sorry, the vessel is delivered after two, three, four years, okay? But also they have to do a lot of foresight in order to plan or forecast demand. Um, and this produces very often lots of imbalance, no? It happened in the financial crisis, no? Until 2008, shipping lines were ordering for the last 20 years vessels and vessels and bigger vessels and bigger vessels because we had seen 30 years of double-digit growth of uh, maritime transport. And suddenly, in 2008, this changed and it hasn't been as it used to be never again. And it's not, I don't think it's going to be never as it was in the 90s or in the beginnings of the 2000s. Um, but demand forecast, as I said, is very difficult. And foresight is very, I'm the head of strategy and my president is not here, so otherwise maybe he would have, he would have to fire me because uh, I'm, <laughs> I think it's extremely complicated. And nowadays more than it used to be 20 years ago or 10 years ago because changes happen very often. At the same time, um, when we think about forecast and, for, and foresight, in our sector we always say there have been three major um, changes or changes of paradigm. No? And nobody, almost nobody, uh, planned that this would have the impact that they had. These were the three following. One, Toyota, okay? a, co a company that lost from a country that lost the Second World War, like Japan, um, changed completely the way supply chains were designed all over the globe. Okay? It's true that they had started in the 30s, no? but Toyota no, made the... No, uh, a pull instead of push, or the opposite, I don't remember ever, no? uh, Just in time, no stocks, etc., etc. No? And, and this was a company that, from a country that had lost the Second World War, and this was then expanded to all automotive industries and to all industries all over. 
Second biggest change in our sector, and that had a lot of impact in globalization, in war, in economic relations, in the balance of powers between Asia, Europe, and a container. No, the container, the box, was invented in 1959. Okay, 1959, yesterday. Okay, uh, nobody expected that the box, metallic box, would change completely. No, the world economy. Okay, without this box, China would not have become the factory of the world. Um, we would, Europeans probably, would not have lost so much history, industry as we have lost in the last 30 years, etc. No? Uh, and the third, and this, some people expected the changes that this would bring, but very few. Um, in, 19, in December 19, and I, I very often I give classes at university and I ask students, no? um, what do you think, what happened in December 2000, uh, in, in December 1978? I don't know. No? China changed its political economy, okay? Deng Xiaoping, no, uh, approved the political of uh, apertura y reforma, I don't know how this is called in, in English, no? And this changed completely uh, the world economy. And changed completely the demand for maritime traffic, the demand for port infrastructure, etc., etc. no? And it's through China, some people expected this would have the impact that finally had, but I still remember um, when I entered the port in 2006, not 1996, some people saying me, ah, oh, this China is something uh, conjunctural. It's not going to last. No? And uh, what we have to look is into Eastern Europe. Okay. Um, so uh, planning is very difficult. <laughs> uh, now, in the last years, some things that we didn't expect either. Um, and this has changed our sector a lot. Uh, in 2021, 2022, after the pandemic, no, suddenly uh, maritime transport um, didn't work well the way it did for the last 50 years. No? And you all know what happened in 2020, 2020 21, 22. Vessels were re late. Uh, reliability in our port vessels before the pandemic used to arrive 90% in time. In time means on the day expected. Um, 2022 and first half of 23, only 30% arrived on the day expected, okay? This one of the main reasons that triggered this um, obsession in the uh, economic uh, autonomy of Europe and the US, okay? Uh, American, uh, there were people that didn't receive their presents for Christmas in the US, uh, companies that had to chance, chat, shut down some assembly lines, uh, prices went up a lot, no, because uh, container freight went from $2,000 to $20,000. So um, this, and very few people expected that after the pandemic, not during the pandemic, because during the pandemic, everything still, uh, after the two first week, uh, things worked uh, quite well, no? Now, more recent, the Red Sea. <laughs> no, very few, nobody expected what happened, or what is happening. Uh, the massacre that is happening in Gaza now, and what would happen next with the attacks from the Houthis into Red Sea, all the vessels uh, being diverted through the Cape of Good Hope, etc., etc. No, um, so I, I don't know if what I'm saying is interesting or not. Because <laughs> what I'm saying is foresight is very difficult, and expected changes are very difficult. We are sports that need to plan 20 years ahead. 20 years ahead um, is is difficult. Um, for instance, another very example now uh, important here in Catalonia, um, or in Spain. Uh, when I entered the port, Spain was basically an importer of Finnish vehicles. Okay? We had factories, but this was an importer of Finnish vehicles. Uh, in 2020-21, the, Spain became the second biggest car manufacturer in Europe after Germany. Okay? We produced three million cars, and we became, as a port, an exporter. Fortunately, Exports, imports needs more or less the same infrastructure, not the same really. But you know, so um, um, now we are discussing: should we have a third uh, car terminal in the port or not? Um, and it's very difficult to plan. Suddenly, last year, which was the traffic that grew the most in the port of Barcelona last year? Imports of Chinese electric vehicles. Why is Deng, Chao, um, Deng Xiaoping? Sorry. <laughs> Why is Xi Jinping in Europe this week in France, Hungary, and Serbia? One of the main reasons to avoid this trade war into Europe and China, and in particular, the, uh, no, the creation of um, customs duties uh, to the import of Chinese electric vehicles. Uh, so, uh, our sector that requires uh, 
uh, amazing investments in terms of infrastructure, both in ports, both in vessels. A container vessel might cost 300 million euros. A container terminal might cost 1.5 billion euros. Uh, foresight is very important, and I'm going to finish here. Uh, it's very difficult at the same time, um, but being difficult, uh, it's extremely important. <laughs> Not to try to uh, miss at least the, the, the general trends, you know? That's it. Thank you. Well, thank you very much.